Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Amen. Come on home. Come on home. Hallelujah. All right, so this, we're talking and ministering on you know, uh, steps to living an overcoming uh, life of faith. Uh, the first point was to recognize the source of your problem, the devil. Recognize the source of your answer, Jesus. Second point is be sure you have promises of God that cover what you asked for. And then this morning we got into the most joyous, favorite one of everybody. Be sure you're not living in sin. But really it was, it, it, we, you know, listen, when we say things, we kind of joke about that a little bit. But the, the fact of the matter is if there are positive things or negative things, if there are positive things we're not doing, if there are negative things that we're not addressing, there's, those things still are undermining to our, our ability to walk by faith. We want to get rid of them so we can walk by faith. And, and as a Christian, we should want whatever is necessary to uh, get us to a place that we can live by faith and have no hindrances or anything in the way. That should be our desire. In other words, to live holy even as he's holy, to walk in that place with him, amen, and, um, and, and be able to live the life that he desires for us to live. Because living in sin can be a hindrance to you living by faith. Well, actually, not just can be. It is a hindrance to you living by faith. And so um, when we hear that, sometimes, you know, the Bible tells you, it says the Lord chastens those he loves. Amen. And if, we, you know, and, and if he doesn't chasten us or doesn't correct us, now here's what the King James says, then we are bastards. And God doesn't, you know, God wants his children to not be illegitimate. He wants them to be walking with him. Amen. And so, you know, th there are times where, times where we have to cover things that nobody likes because we like the good stuff. We like that you're going to have a million dollars when you give in this offering. Hallelujah. And everybody runs, shouts, and they're all happy. But sometimes we need to get solemn and be aware that there are things that are hindering us and get that straight so we can run and be happy. All right. So now we're going to pick up with the next point. We're not going to spend any more time there. Go, if you will, to the 11th chapter of the book of Mark, um, also known as Hagen 11. That's, that's just a joke. Brother Hagen never thought that. He never, ever, he never insinuated that. It was just a joke. <clears throat> if, if, you're a, um, heresy, if you're a heresy hunter, go away. Hallelujah. But you know, our, our next point is this. Be sure that no doubt or unbelief is permitted in your life. No doubt or unbelief. Look at Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Uh, Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. So whosoever will have whatsoever if they don't doubt in their heart. Amen. Now this is the key. Uh, if you'll go back and read uh, E.W. Kenyon's writings, he has some interesting things to say about um, mental ascent. He said mental ascent looks like faith, acts like faith, uh, can be viewed like faith, but in reality it is simply a mental acknowledgement or a mental um, state that says, I agree with that, but it's not of the heart. It's not out of your spirit. See, faith is a spiritual force. It is not a head force. It's not out of your thoughts. It's out of your spirit. And so that's why Jesus said, you know, because I've seen a lot of people make themselves say the right things, but they didn't believe it. Yeah. That's the big key. And let me tell you something. You and God are the ones who know if you believe it or not. I can't. Because you could be saying it. I've, I've had people say stuff to me, and, you know, and I'm saying, going, yeah, man, you got it. You got it. You got faith. I mean, I mean listen to you. You got it going on. And they, and they don't have it. Get to them finally, and they get, they, well, you know, I never did believe what I was saying. Well, if you don't believe what you're saying, then it's not faith. Now, that's, don't stop saying it, but understand where you are. If you don't believe it, you're confessing. You're meditating. And until that meditation becomes to a point in your life where you believe it, it's not faith. So you have to believe it in order for it to be faith, okay? So uh, Hebrews 3.14, we, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. And so here we are. Uh, Jesus said that if you'll say with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll have what you say. 
Proverbs, I mean, uh, Hebrews says that we are partakers if we hold the beginning of our confidence. See, when you are confident that what you're saying is going to come to pass, amen, then, you're, then that's faith. You know, you have, a, you have an accomplice, you have a knowing, you have a knowledge, you, you do believe it. Um, uh, when um, Joshua and um, Caleb went over, the, over as part of the 12 spies, they came back with a good report. They said, we're well able to take this land. They saw the same giants. They saw the same walled cities. They saw the same people in the land, yet they came back. And when the people said, the giants, there be there, there are giants there. They eat, they eat up the inhabitants thereof. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And Joshua and Caleb, still the people said, let us go up at once, or we are well able. They said they saw the same thing. They saw the exact same thing. One came back with a different, why? Because God had said that he was going to bring them into a land that floweth with milk and honey. Amen. Are you all here? You're going home. All right, let's have the bobblehead thing going on at least. Acknowledge that you're breathing and moving. All right. I'm going to go out here and put on the front of the building tonight. If you all guys don't, don't get with it, we're going to put out the, the Faith and Victory Church of the, uh, the Frozen Chosen. All right, now, nobody wants that, do they? Don't want anybody to see you coming out of there, do you? All right. Laven up. Hallelujah. And so, um, we're to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, in the walk of faith, we hold it steadfast until the end of the manifestation, until we see the manifested result of it. If we believe it, we just hold fast to that. We, we do not let go of that. We maintain that position of faith all the way through. Somebody say glory. glory. Hallelujah. We don't let go of it. If you really believe it, and see, if you really, really believe it, in your heart of hearts, you're going to hold, you're, you, I, mean, I mean, you may not, may not write a song about you called Hang On Sloopy. Some of y'all remember Hang On Sloopy. Hang On Sloopy, Hang On. How many remember Hang On Sloopy? I can be, who doesn't remember Hang On Sloopy? Karen, I think Karen. Hang On Sloopy, Sloopy, Hang On. No, Sloopy, it was Sloopy, S-L-O-O. -O. I, I used to think it was Snoopy too. But it, it, I, I looked it up one day, and it was sloopy. <laughs> yeah, I thought of the same thing there, uh, Lloyd. It was, I thought it was snoopy, but it was sloopy. Boy, somebody's going to have a good time with this when they see this on the Internet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not, you know, hanging on in the sense of, oh, dear God, i got to hang on. But you're holding fast. There's a difference between hanging on and holding fast. Amen. Holding fast is a position that you are in. I am holding fast. You're remaining steadfast. You're holding your ground. I got this. The position of faith. And so uh, in this, because Jesus said you don't doubt in your heart, means there's no room for doubt if you're going to walk by faith in, in your heart. In your heart. I saw a scripture today that uh, someone posted that said, you know, uh, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And Mark, I remember Mark Brzee's, uh the Mark Brzee translation of that was, Lord, I believe my head's giving me a fit. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I've always kind of thought that was, that's a pretty good translation for that one. Uh, your head is not the place of faith. So no more than can you mentally assent and get it, can the faith of the heart be deterred simply because your head's giving you a fit. Your heart's going, yeah, I got it. And your head's going, whoa, I don't know how this is going to work. Shut up. You don't need to know. Just shut up. Go think on good things. <laughs> Amen. Whatsoever is lovely, just, pure. Amen. What you've seen in us do. Amen. So, no doubt, you can't afford doubt. That means you've got to keep, stay filled up with faith. How do you stay filled up with faith? You keep staying filled up with the Word. And you keep speaking the Word. That is where faith is birthed. That is where faith is maintained. That is where faith is fostered. That is where faith is uh, energized to bring to pass what you're believing. Second one goes along with it. The next one. Sincerely desire the benefit. Look over in Mark 11, 24. Right after Mark 11, 23. Last time I checked. If it's not, there's something wrong with our Bibles. You remember Jesus said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe the things he saith shall come to pass. He'll have what? Whatsoever he saith. Then he goes on in verse 24 and says, Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire. Now the word desire here 
is a Greek word that's also translated in other places in the New Testament as lust. Same word. So the context determines whether it's inordinate lust or ungodly lust or if it's a godly lust. Okay? We have to have, you have to have a desire. I've tried to minister to people before. They didn't have a desire to get what they, they said they were after. You know, you're trying to get them well or whatever. They, just, they don't have a desire to get well. They want to die. On one side, they're saying, well, yeah, you know. I mean, they got kids there. They got, you know, uh, uh, other ones trying to talk them into it. But they really, they just ready to, they just ready to die. You can't help people that are ready to die. You can't, talk, if it's, you can talk them out of it. You can't help them. We had, we had um, one lady one time that uh, she, she would come to church. She, she came to our church. And, and maybe, you know, I was, I was a lot younger. And, and, and if I had known more about people, maybe I could have helped her more. But she came in. She was in pretty, pretty last stages of cancer. And we, we, you know, we started, listen, you got to do this. You got to do this. Kind of got, you know, you need to just put down, just get into the, the, the uh, what I used to call the greenhouse effect. You know? I mean, in, in nature, you can only plant in certain seasons, and you have to wait for the weather to be right. But in a greenhouse, you've got a controlled environment. You can make it do stuff in the middle of the wrong season, and it'll work. So in other words, you have to be in a controlled environment. That, that's what I'm talking about. See, a greenhouse is a controlled environment. And so you're going, you're going to try to grow cabbage in the middle of the winter when it grows in the summer. Well, then in a greenhouse, you put the heat in there, you put extra, extra light in there, you water it with watering systems that, that instead of natural rain. You do all the stuff to give it the, the effect that it's in the middle of the summer. Yeah. Well, when you're, in a, when you're in certain situations of life physically, you may have to get into the greenhouse effect. You may have to get into a completely controlled environment. I mean, turn off the TV, yeah. get rid of the newspaper, do whatever it is that you control the environment so you're in, you're in the environment where you're going to get what you need from God. All right. So I told, I said, we, said, we told the lady and, and, and our, our assistant with us at the time, we would uh, we'd go visit her. So, you know, well, you could still feel the heat from the TV and see the radiation dust all over it. And the books and the tapes you'd given the week before were still sitting there, never moved. Okay. And, and you know, and, and you, you talk for a few minutes and then you kind of gently try to say, you know, you really need. You really need to take this and, and, and listen to it and read it and do this. Okay? And then it got, you know, we, you got to where you come visit, and they were in the room with the window shade pulled because they, they felt so bad. And, yeah, um, well, it, it just bothers them to, to, you know, to hear a tape going. How bad do you want it? Yeah. How bad do you want what you need from God? Now, on the other hand, we had um, um, around not, not too off, to off that same time frame, now, and she did pass away. She went home to be with the Lord. She loved the Lord. Yeah. But she, her desire to, to live wasn't strong enough. Right. She wasn't willing to do the things she needed to do. We're putting everything in her hands. See, you can't make people do it. you got you got to sincerely desire, strongly desire the benefit of what you're after. Yeah. Now, um, um, around that same time period, maybe not the same year, but you know, we had a, um, there was a doctor it was out of our home church where we're from. And uh, he had come up. He was up in one of the local uh, hospitals over in Winston with some very serious issues going on. Had had some neck issues. And they had done a surgery um, to fuse the neck. And something happened. It got infected. And, and our pastor called us and said, listen, you know, would you do us a ministerial courtesy? Uh, and and I, we knew them because we had been in that church. They said, would you do us a ministerial courtesy and go visit? Because for them, it's a four-hour drive. Well, I'm 30 minutes away. I'll go visit for you. You know, we, we have, we have a, a connection. I'm out of that church. Um, that's my pastor. It's your pastor. Da, 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 da. You know what I'm saying? So there, there is a connection there. And so went in, and, and the wife was like a, like a Holy Ghost little woman. You know, he was a doctor. You know, he got a little analytical, whatever. And, um, but we, we, um, we went several times, two or three times, and brought books. I said, now listen, play these tapes all the time. She said, okay. She, and she started playing them. She sit there, it was, it was in the day you didn't have auto reverse. Okay, or it wasn't really available. So she just sat there and kept turning the tapes over. Kept, and then took the books we brought, little Brother Hagen books on healing and stuff, and would just read them out loud to him. Now I talked to him. I said, now listen, you're a doctor. And because you're a doctor, you know 
in your head, not only can you just kind of hear what they're saying, go, oh, that's not good. You understand from a purely uh, educational standpoint, you know what they're talking about in a degree you shouldn't know because it's counterproductive to you to that level. I said, so you're going to have to put that down and you're going to take a hold of the word of God. Let me tell you something. Yes. In three weeks, he went home totally free from the infection. They were talking about having to unfuse the deck and do all kinds of weird things. He got healed. But you know what? He desired it. And they, they got together. I had gone back to one of the times after I'd given the books and told them what to do. She, I'm reading this to him every time. He's, he's listening to me. They were playing the tapes all the time. Hallelujah. He's up walking around and, and so forth. And in just a few weeks, he was out, gone home, and healed. Amen. What was the difference? One desired it more than the other. They had a strong desire. They were willing to do what they needed to do to get the job done. Bobblehead time. Or you could amen so that people can hear us. All right? You have to strongly desire the benefit. Well, you know, it wasn't Ed Taylor. I did, I did the same kind of counseling with the other person. Put materials relevant to where they were in their hands. Told them what they needed to do. Hello? Told the other person the same thing. What's the difference? One had a stronger desire. And because one had a stronger desire, they got the answer. They stayed after it and did it. Oh, here you're going home. Now, desire can be associated, not always, but uh, the strong desire can be associated with your hope. Do you have hope that you're going to get the answer? Don't lose hope. You know, or don't lose the, you know, don't lose the will. See, this is one of the things, you, when you lose the will to live, you can't, you can't keep people here either. Either. I mean, we had one person one time that uh, years ago, they were in our church, family was in our church. The mother wasn't in our church, but the mother was in the hospital. They wanted me to go visit with her. And, and I did. You know, they, the mom said, it's fine. You know, they, I, don't, I don't think she really had a pastor. And so in that situation, you know, when people ask you to come, we'll, we'll go. If, 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 the, if the patient asks us to come or, or wants us to come, we'll go. If they've got a home church and a pastor and they don't ask us to come, we don't go just because the grandchild wants us to go. And there's reasons for that. One, you're walking on some ministerial ethic issues. Other is, if they don't want you there, there ain't no need going. <laughs> you may as well go pull on Superman's cape and spit in the wind and pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger. All right? So, and go best around with Jim. Yeah. All right, hallelujah. Jim Croce. Okay. So anyway, Went up to the hospital. They wanted me to pray for her to get healed. Well, I got and got to talk to her. And all she could talk about was she wanted to know she was saved. And we talked to her for a little while. Found out she had given her heart to her, but she was back. So they prayed with her, got her right with God. Sat up in bed for several days just talking about how, how everything was just so wonderful. She was ready to go home and be with the Lord. She just, you know, she was so happy everything was right with her and God. And uh, the son kept holding on to her. She said, now let me go home. I can't, Mama, I can't let you go. See, she didn't want to leave. She wanted to go home. She had, she had finally gotten everything in order, and she was at a place in her life, you know, it's a good time for me to go. She didn't desire the benefit of being well. She desired the benefit of going to heaven. And that's where her desire was, and that's where her heart was. And, um. We were in church one night uh, during this time, and uh, the, the wife of, of the daughter-in-law came in and sat at the back row, and when she did, the Holy Ghost said, you, go you tell her to go tell her husband, he called his name, to go tell him to let his mama go. This is, this is, you understand, if you can't turn their will, you can't, change, you can't change things. And she jumped up right in the middle of that service and ran out the back door and went straight to the hospital. See, Pastor Red said to tell you that the Lord said to tell you to let, his mom, let your mama go. He said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And, uh, and, and the mama the whole time is going, let me go. Let me go. And she's, uh, she's able to sit up and talk to him and carry on conversation with him. And he finally said, okay, mama, I'm going to let you go. Six hours later, she was in heaven. See? And, that's, and I told the family back at the very beginning when, when, she, when I kind of found out where she was, I said, if you can't get her to turn around and want to live, you can't keep her here. And he kept her here about a week, just holding on, wouldn't let her go. But the minute he said, you can go home, she's gone. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. 
Amen. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, 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 death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Hallelujah. Amen. The last enemy, put under foot, uh, last enemy to be put on your foot is death. But you understand, you have to desire the benefit. You have to desire to get up and walk out. You've got to have a strong desire if you're going to live by faith to get the answer that way. Now, listen, I'll be honest with you, there was no less faith to go home than it is to stay. The Bible says about all the Old Testament, these have died in faith. Now, I know it's talking about they died in the faith of what was coming, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, who recently went home to be with the Lord? One of, one of, um, yeah, Brother Cooper. I think on Friday he told everybody he was ready to go. Like, like you know, a couple days before he went home, he, he said, I'm ready to go. And he went. His name? Charles Capps. That's who that's, uh, that, Yeah, Brother Cooper was, yeah. Charles Capps on a Friday told everybody he was ready to go and went home on, I think, Sunday. So I'm going home. I'm ready to go. Praise God. Well, praise the Lord. Well, Summerall stood in his last sermon that he preached and said the, gave an account of the ministry, a state of the ministry. Evangelion, their cargo ship was paid for. The C-130 cargo plane was paid for. The ministry was in the black. He said, I'll see you on the other side. And they would, you know, a few days he was in heaven. Was, you know, then if, you desire, if you sincerely desire the benefit to go home, you can go home. Amen. But if you sincerely desire to be healed and walk out your walk on the earth, now a lot, a lot of these people I'm talking about are older people. You don't need to be 40 years old desiring to go home. There's work for you to do. Amen. There's things for you to do. There's a job for you to do. The kingdom needs you here. Amen. So let's get the job done. Somebody else say amen. So sincerely desire the benefit. Next is ask in faith, nothing wavering. Go with me, if you will, to James, the first chapter. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did not read a verse to you. Look at Proverbs 2, then we'll run over to James. Back on sincerely desire to benefit. Everybody say, God is good. Proverbs 2, verse 2. I oh, will just start with verse 1. My son, if you will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that you will incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge. See, that's desire. And liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, here you go. What are we looking for? We're looking at somebody who has, who's seeking, who's crying out. This is a desire. You have to desire the benefit. If you want it, you've got to desire it. If you desire it, you'll do something about it. I said, amen. If you desire it, you'll do something about it. And you'll, you'll stay after it. Amen? Now, let's ask God nothing in faith, nothing. Wavering. Go over to James chapter 1. Be our last point tonight. We'll, we'll get up next week and get into uh, finishing this up. Hallelujah. If I can get my pages to come unstuck. Oh, my. Here's why I couldn't find it it's out of my Bible. The part that fell out the other week. It didn't get put back in the right place. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to have to get me a new Bible. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, and give it to all men liberally, not braveth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, here we are. We're going to ask in faith, nothing wavering. That means you can't, you can't be going, um, 
You can't be going, I want to do this, or I want this from God, I want God to do this. And on the inside, you're hoping that it doesn't happen. That way it goes a completely different direction. You're not in faith. You're, you're double-minded. Hello? If you're, if you're saying, um, I wish I could just, you know, oh, God, I want to live and not die. And over here, you just wish, I just wish I could go home. You're double-minded. You're wavering. You have to get to the place that you're, you're, uh, you're in harmony and you're saying what you believe and you're not wavering about it. Come on now. Look over in Romans, the fourth chapter. James says we have to ask in faith nothing wavering. You can't, you can't waver between two opinions. Somebody say amen. Romans, the fourth chapter, starting in verse 16. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. And not to that only which is of the law, but also that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, but when he was a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded. Oh, I'm, you go right back to King, I believe King Agrippa, and he says, almost thou persuadest, Paul, talking to Paul, the almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And being fully persuaded that he, he had promised, what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness Glory to God. Now, here we are. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen. And being fully persuaded. I said being fully persuaded. You can't be partially persuaded. Partially persuaded is really hope. You want it to happen. You really wish it would happen. It's kind of like when you go buy, if you go buy a lottery ticket. I'm not saying you should be. Just saying if you do. You have no basis for faith you're going to win the $350 million. You sure would like to. I, you know, and, and really, if, if you had bought one, I sure wish you would. <laughs> Tithe would be amazing. Hallelujah. Well, that's unclean money. We'll sanctify it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Let's get off of that. Amen. Hallelujah. But, you, you know, you don't have any basis. You, you're just wishing it would happen. And you can dream about what you would do with it if you got it. Am I right? Yep. Am I right about it? Hallelujah. Amen. Am I talking about it right? Come on now. Have I got it? Yeah. If you, if you go by that lottery ticket, you're wishing, you're hoping, but you have no basis for faith. Am I, isn't that right? Well, if you don't have a basis for faith, then you can't receive by faith. You're, you're, you're not asking in faith, nothing wavering. There's no basis for being in faith. So you're, you will waver because, you know, uh, they start calling the numbers. Oh, mine probably won't be there. Well, one minute you're wishing you had it. Next minute you think it ain't going to happen. See, if you're in faith, you're, pu you're fully persuaded. There's a confidence that you have what you're believing for. You're not going to be wavering between, oh, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. It's kind of like that old thing you used to do when you wanted to date a girl. You go get a flower. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me. <laughs> Start over because the petals ran out. You're going to end up with the wrong one. Hallelujah. She loves me not. Well, you're double-minded. That's that, that is the, the epitome of double-mindedness. You, you know, you just don't, you're going to give it up to the chance of the flower petals. You know, like I said, you know, if you get to the end, it's not going to work out what you want. You throw it down, and pick it up, and don't start over. May, somehow, must by some hocus pocus, somehow, some way, some, some method, it's going to work out, and you're actually going to get her to love you. I remember, I remember the little notes. I like you. Do you like me? Check yes, no, or maybe. <laughs> Got a lot of no's back. Anyway. And I finally got Janie. She was crazy enough to say yes. All right. 
But notice here, he said he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Amen? Unbelief will undermine <clears throat> any ability. I mean, when, you know, we, we, how many have looked at promises of God? You say, wow, that's awesome. But I'm not sure I believe that. And it's not that you, don't, you believe God lies. It's like, that's bigger than what I can believe. Well, what do you do? You've got to get it to the Word, and you've got to feed on that Word until it becomes a real reality in you. you just got to stay after it. Somebody say amen. I mean, how long do you stay after it? Till you get it. I mean, that's real simple, isn't it? You stay after it till you get it. How will you know when you get it? You'll know. You will know when you got it. When you come to the place that you understand, that, you, that you're fully persuaded. See, I grew up in church. I heard about Jesus my whole life. Amen. The Lord um, moved on me. When, and, and like Janie said, July 11th, 1979. The Lord moved on me at that stage in my life. Hallelujah. And I, and I came to where I just didn't adhere to my, fam my family's church and believe you know, well, I believe this because it's where my family goes to church. There was a point, I was just so fully, I, I had to give everything to Jesus because I just had to give everything to Jesus because I was fully persuaded that's what I needed to do because he was at my answer to life. Yeah. Well, I haven't gone back from that either. I'm, I'm still serving the Lord. I'm not, I'm not going, I haven't gone out and experienced with other religions because I think maybe I made a mistake. I, I know. I know I'm right. I know this is the truth. I know that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. I'm fully persuaded and confident of that fact. I believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for the church today. Because the Bible teaches it, because I've lived it. Yeah. Experienced it. Well, I don't believe in that. Well, that's your problem, not mine. I believe it. I walk in it. The Bible teaches it, and I live it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So you ask your faith, nothing way. Look at 1 Timothy 2. That's before 2 Timothy. I'm just trying to help you all with your Bibles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 2. Paul writes in verse 8, he says, I, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Remember, we are asking faith, nothing wavering. To waver, to be in doubt, is detrimental to a faith walk. Um, you can live your life and, and get to the point that you'll turn away from the thing. How could you turn away from the things of God? Begin doubting. Letting doubt to enter your life. It, 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 it will work against you in every arena. Because if it can get a foothold over here on healing or on prosperity or this or that, it's all, the ultimate goal of that is to get to your place where you even believe in Jesus. It was, it's a cancer. It's a cancer to faith. Doubt is a cancer to faith. And you need to treat it as such. You need to put some Holy Ghost chemo on it. The Word of God. Amen? Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance, the ground, the confidence, the title deed, one translation says, of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, remember earlier we talked about that if you lose your hope, <coughs> you will get in trouble. <coughs> you have to have hope. You have to, you have to hope that something will happen. You have to know, look at God's word and say, well, there's hope there. And then go feed on it until faith comes. Faith, hope, and love all abide. The greatest is love. But you've got to have, listen, if you've got faith and don't have any hope to put it in, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Brother Copeland had a series out years ago uh, called Hope, the Blueprint of Faith. Your hope in something gives your faith something to lay hold of and bring to pass. Well, I believe that God can. That God can. See, until you get to where there's a hope that God will in your life about something, then it's just going, there's, nothing, there's nothing to lay hold of. All right? 
Now, faith is the substance, the grounds, the title deed, the substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things, the evidence of things what? I ain't going to believe it until I see it. All right, Thomas, go ahead on. Now, how many remember what Jesus did when Thomas, he appeared and Thomas came to him? Remember, Thomas gets in the room with all the guys, you know, one of the top 12. All right, actually, the top 11 at this point in time because Judas has hung himself. All right, we're down to 11. They're in the room, and the disciples come and say, we saw the Lord. And Thomas, Peter must have rubbed off on him. I'll tell you who you associate with with a rub off on you. Amen? And so watch who you associate with. Just saying. Thomas goes, is that I see the print of the nail in his hands and st thrust my hand into his side. I'll be, you know, stick my finger in the palm of his hand and thrust my hand into his side. I'll not believe. A few days later, they're all shut up together. Jesus appears and goes, Thomas! Come over here, reach, reach forth. Put your finger in the, in the print of my hands. Put your hand, thrust your hand into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas goes, my Lord and my God. I've heard a lot of sermons preached on my Lord and my God. Jesus was not commending Thomas for his lack of faith. Thomas, because you've seen, you believed. Blessed is the man that has not seen and yet believes. So the whole Thomas story is not a commendation of his great faith. It's a rebuke. Amen. I said it's a rebuke. Here, faith, the, the book of Hebrews says that, that our faith is the evidence of things not seen. You can't wait till you see it to believe it. That's not faith. I said that's not faith. That's carnal. I don't believe it. Unless I can see it, I don't believe it. Then you're, don't, you're not believing. Hello? You are a carnal, sense-ruled believer. And that is not a faith life. Go on. For by it, that is by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand. The world's refrained by the word of God. Listen to this. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What happened? God spoke it and it happened. He, he just said it and it looked out there and nothing. Light be. Light was. Now King James says, let there be light. The Hebrew actually stated this way. God said, light be. Light was. And I wish, I wish science would just you know, understand that they're, that they're not as smart as they think they are. They come along a few thousand years later and prove what God did. So they said that the universe is still expanding in every direction at the speed of light from a single point. Yeah, light be. Yeah. It's still doing what God told it to do. It hadn't stopped. The first account of what we have God saying is still in force today. Yeah. Light be. The universe is still expanding in every direction at the speed of light because of the Big Bang. Yeah, there was a bang. One day, there was nothing out there, and God walked up and goes, light be, Big Bang. Light was, and light's still doing. Hello? They got a lot of faith in their stuff. They think they got it all together. I don't like you doing. I remember the scientists, when Columbus's day, all the scientists believed the earth, earth was flat. Yeah. And the Bible had said for thousands of years that God wrote on the circumference of the earth. That's round. R-O-U-N-D. They said it was F-L-A-T. All the brilliant minds of the day, it's F-L-A-T, it's flat. The Bible said it was round. Hello? By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated, that he should not see death. Before God had translated him, um, let me get my Bible. For he, before his, test, his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For they that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Glory to God. We can, so you've got, you've got to be, if we read this whole chapter, by faith Noah being, my goodness, it's so crumpled up there, I'm going to have to, I'm just going to open my, 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 my Bible on, on my computer so I can read it. I mean, these pages are kind of all wrinkled up. I, I can't hardly read them. At least, at least I didn't throw it away. It just happened to be in the wrong place. I'm going to blame somebody else. I think the week that it happened, cats picked it up and stuck it in the front. Oh, Jessica, oh, boy, you, you heard the woman, the woman you gave me. I was right here on camera. <laughs> You're out. All right. New son-in-law looking for a new son-in-law. Tease it. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen, uh, of things not seen as yet, not the movie, the Bible. Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. He had to walk in faith about building a boat when he had never seen rain. I'm not talking about a drought, we're talking about his whole life. He'd never seen 120 years, he never saw rain. Until the day God shut up the, the ark. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which after he should receive for inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whether he went. See, we always want all the details. God's telling us to do stuff where there's no details. It's called the walk of faith. Well, how am I, don't worry about the how, just do. Enthusiasm, come on church. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him with the same promise. He looked for a city whose foundations and builder and maker is God. Um, for through faith also Sarah received strength to conceive seed, was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even one of him as good as dead, as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude and the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things de declare plainly, they seek a country. Let me say this. We declare we seek the country of, of, of the life of faith. This world system is designed to govern you by sight. Everything about it. How many have noticed... <coughs> Our politics are sight-driven now. Let me just give you an example. How many ever have you at least studied or heard of the Kennedy-Nixon debates? Okay, 1960 when they when they had the debates for the presidential primary during the presidential race. Everybody who heard the debates on radio, by far the polls all show, all those who listened to the debates on the radio said Nixon won hands down. Everybody watched on television, Kennedy went hands up or hands down on the television. It was, it was the marketing, and that's when politics became media-driven, visual. It's all, about the, it's all about the look. They were looking at Kennedy. And, you know, when you look at Kennedy, you look at Nixon. Nixon Kennedy was supposed to be hot, good-looking, you know, and everybody said, oh, he's good-looking. We're going to vote for him. But when they, when they could only hear them, Nixon was, and Nixon was a brilliant you go back to Nixon, I mean, I know he messed up in Watergate, but I'm telling you, he was brilliant. His foreign policies and his, his understanding of world affairs, was, he was brilliant. There's just no doubt about it. I mean, history, history, history does confirm that. But because of, because of sight, Kennedy won. And now, it's, I mean, now everything's about sight. It's all about imagery. Everything's about, that, that, we, we live on sound bites in the elections. One little... You go into a restaurant, and you sit down, and there's a placard on your table usually of some amazing-looking dessert. Now, I'm a cherry cheesecake guy. I like New York-style cheesecake, you know, nice and, I mean, just. I mean, just, just turn your stomach into happy land. Glory to God. And cherries all over with the, with the cherry syrup juice just running down there. If you look at the placard, they got 10, 12 cherries on there. I mean, the, the, that cherry, you know, that, that, stock, that cherry juice in there, you know, that stock of the, the, the sugary syrup just running all down in that cheesecake. And you order it. 
Now, first of all, you've got to get over the, the, the difference in size of the piece of cake to start with. And the ten now down to two cherries. With a little Flintstone syrup. What do you mean? A little dabble, do you? I'm sorry, Brill Cream. That's Brill Cream, isn't it? It's the Abba Dabba Doos, Flintstones. Brill Cream was a little dabble, do you? How many of y'all remember the old Brill Cream commercials? You know, that was, the, that was the grease that people used to put in their hair, you know, Brill Cream. My brother took my, not the one with this, this was recently, my older brother, we were younger. There was a tube of toothpaste and a tube of uh, a box with Brill Cream and toothpaste in it. He switched the boxes. Well, my dad was working second shift. And so he got up one, one time and all the blinds pulled down. He had everything, room darkening, everything. Got up, went to the bathroom and opened the box. Didn't even look. He's like half asleep. <laughs> Slapped some real cream on his toothbrush and went. <laughs> Didn't take long. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. How did I get up with all that? Oh, yeah. The imagery. Seeing stuff. Amen? Hallelujah. All about sight. We live in a sight-driven society. And um, we have to declare that, we are, that we're seeking a country whose builder and maker is God. Not, not living in imagery. You know, our, we're, just so, we're, so, we're so driven by that. Everything, you know, probably about 50% of stuff on television is sold by sex. I mean, beer commercials. If you drink this beer, you're going to have five hot women in skimpy ba bikinis hanging all over you. No, you're going to be drunk, and you're going to think somebody is that, and they're not. <laughs> did that come out of my Oh, yeah, it did. We're all image-driven, and so we want to see. And God's saying, believe what you can't see. God's saying, obey when you can't see what's going to happen. I'm telling you what the end result's going to be. How you get there is up to me. God could have led Israel another way, but he led them where he led them. The way he led them. He didn't make them stay in the wilderness. Their mouth made them stay in the wilderness. Hello. Y'all hear you gone home. We read this verse earlier this year, verse 15. Truly, if they've been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. Now, remember at the beginning of the year, I taught on Egypt just ain't all that. There ain't nothing back there you need to go back and get. It ain't worth it. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared for them a city. And I'm not going to read the rest. There's a lot more. Than that. We could go and read this. The life of faith is not a life of sight. Life of faith is believing that God said what he said and meant what he said and do what he said when you act in the way he said to act. That means believe it. Act on it. Walk it. Amen. Amen. You can't be wavering. You got to just go, you know, God said, let's go do it. Go get it. Let's run after it. But I can't see anything. Don't worry about it. Um, trying to think. We were driving somewhere. Yeah, we were, we were, um, we had, uh, a couple weeks ago, me and Jamie, and took Nathan with us, didn't we? When we went over to Biltmore, drove over there, and then, and then one of the days, we, we spent one night, and we just, you know, we found a cheap hotel, we stayed, so we just had to drive all the way home, that's like, and so the next day, we we're going to do something different, we were going to go take the Brevard waterfall route, in US 64 from Brevard to Franklin, there's a bunch of waterfalls off the roads and stuff. And uh, so we stopped in the Brevard at the uh, Vista Center, and they said, well, you know, you, you ought to go see these looking glass falls. They go back and find the such and such, such and such, and turn there. So we started driving back, and, we, and, I, and I had seen the Pizza Hut coming in. We started driving back and think, well, they won't this far out. So we stopped and turned around and went, well, it's not on this road either. Went all out the wrong side of town. Well, this is this, this too, we just kind of just going this debate. Finally turned around and went back and just kept driving, kept driving, kept driving. We didn't go far enough going back we had to go another three miles the guy had told us the wrong thing he said he said if you see the the, the Kmart you've gone too far no we hadn't gone far enough he got his stores mixed up all right it was Walmart if you saw you had gone too far 
There's a big difference between Kmart and Walmart, especially when you're using for, for land, land points, markers. So we go back, and we keep, and on the second time back, we keep going, 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 going. So, you know, how many know when you're looking for something, it seems like forever? Yeah. The first time. And then when you come back from that the, and go back the second time, it don't seem nearly as far. And it's the same way in your walk of faith. There's a lot of times your walk of things out, and it seems like forever. <laughs> and the next time you do it, man, that would take, take long at all. So we got back up to the pizza, turned left, went up, got to look in Glass Falls. Glad we did. It's a beautiful drive. We got some information. We're going we're gonna to go do um, sometime. We're just going to take day trips and, and go start to do all the, like, there's 15 waterfalls or so in, uh, north of 64 up in that part of the mountains. Some of them are hike in. Some of them are drive in. We're going to go do them all. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start checking them off and doing them because there's supposed to be some beautiful waterfalls in there. Looking Glass Falls is pretty cool. But the point of this is this. When you're walking it out, it's going to, a lot of times when you're on a destination, on a journey you've never been on before, it seems like it takes forever. I remember the first time I went to Tulsa. Now, I was driving from Greenville, North Carolina, all the way to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the speed limit back in, back in uh, 1980 was 55. 50 drive 55. Remember that? What did that mean? Everybody had to drive 55. There was no states you could drive above 55 in. All 50 states drove 55 because it was going to save gas. No, it just took everybody longer to get there. It took me from Greenville to Tulsa, took 24 and a half hours. And that was doing a little speeding. Now, I can make it from Greensboro to Tulsa, and may, I think they did it uh, one of the times in the past couple of years when the girls were out there. Uh, we made it in 16 hours and 15 minutes, and it's 2 hours and 45 minutes to Greenville. So that's 17, that's 19, that's five hours and a half, five and a half hours shorter than back then. But that first time we went, and I remember the first time Janie went. I took over after the, the trip down the mountains. I was like, you ain't driving no more. Had my little gremlin, my demon-possessed car. Had little demon gremlins all over it. And I made a little bed in the back of the, it was a hatchback, so I made a little bed back there. And we got to, kind of close to the mountains near Asheville, something we had driven from Greenville. Back then, to drive, drive from Greenville to Asheville took close to seven hours. U.S. 264 was two lane. Uh, you ha and, then, and then you had to take uh, all through 70 out of around Raleigh, which it wasn't likely is now, up to 85 and pick up 85 between Raleigh and Durham on that side and drive. It was two lane all the way and drive all the way up to our mountains. And it was just, it was, just, it was bad road back then. Even the interstates weren't good. So we got to the mountains and I put Janie in charge. I was going to sleep. And I wake up rolling from one side to the other. Wham, wham, wham. I'm thinking, what are you doing? I'm following this tractor trailer down the mountain. Pull over! <clears throat> because about the time we come around the corner and there's a horse trailer had turned over and they're trying to get the horses out and stuff. Thinking, I'm driving! She had never driven anywhere like that. That was her first trip driving like that. I'm like, okay. I get it. And I start confessing, I want to live and not die. I'm driving! Putting some action with my faith! I love you, sweetie. Hadn't let her drive to Tulsa since. No, I'm, not, I'm joking. I let her drive a little bit sometime. But you can understand why I have, I have a apprehension about letting her take over me go to sleep in the mountains. That was in that 40 pass, you know, that real, yeah, no fun. Hallelujah. Where was I say? I was talking about living by faith and not by sight. Amen. Glory to God. We, we, have to, we have to walk it out that way. You can't, you, can't, um, uh, uh, you can't waver. You have to know that God's speaking. So anyway, on a journey for the first time, it seems like it takes forever. I remember, I'm telling you, how many of you ever driven about across Tennessee? It's 457 miles from the North Carolina border to the Mississippi River. Yeah, that's what you feel like. And you're not. You get to Oklahoma City, you're a little bit past Oklahoma City, you're about halfway across. Yeah, but man, when you get to Memphis, it's like 450. See, it's only 420 miles from the border to Wilmington. 
You're 40 miles out in the ocean when you get out of Tennessee. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a long way. And the first time you ever do it, you think, this is the state that never ends. It just goes on and on, my friend. So you go to Texas. Unless you go across the panhandle. Yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't driven across Texas. I've driven to Dallas and back out. All right. But the, the point is, here is, is these journeys of faith. When you're walking things out for the first time, and you, all you know is your destination, and you don't know what it's like along the way, there's no marker. God just said, go. There's going to be times it just seems like it's never going to end. But let me tell you something. You keep going, and you keep driving, and you keep following the road signs, and guess what? You get off of the Muskogee Turnpike about 40 miles into Oklahoma and turn north and go 58 miles, and you'll see a sign that says Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. What happened? You just kept following the signs. You kept following the Word. You kept following the Spirit of God. And the place that you said you were going to end up is where you end up. You may not have ever experienced that path before. You may not have ever seen the things you saw before. I mean, ever in your life. But you ended up. See, that's how faith is. Faith starts on a journey. God gives you a goal. And God says, you're going to do this, or I want you to do this, or you see it in the Word. You're, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And you start there. And you're going to see things along the way you've never seen. You're going to encounter stuff you've never encountered. You're going to run into things you've never run into. And then, all of a sudden, there you are. And when you turn around and go back, oh, yeah, I've been down this road before. Now, I can tell you what. I can drive to Oklahoma and kind of know, I, and I can just about open my eyes and look out the window and tell you where I am. I've driven it so many times. I know when I'm up on the Cumberland Plateau. I know when I'm, when I'm in the Ozarks. I know when we're near Jackson, Tennessee. I know when we're in the, the flat, uh, the, the, the bottoms of Arkansas near the, where the, all the rice paddies are. You just, you, you just, you know, you know when you're in Oklahoma and you, you've drunk, you've gone down that road. But I'm telling you, the more mature you get in faith, the more you recognize things on the road. And you'll know when you're getting closer to the answer. Hallelujah. Just because you've matured in it. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.